am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though this body shall be destroyed, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I myself shall see, and my eyes behold him who is my friend and not a stranger. For none of us has life in himself, and none becomes his own master when he dies. For if we have life, we are alive in the Lord, and if we die, we die in the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's possession. Happy from now on are those who die in the Lord. So it is, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of your servant Louise and grant her an entrance into the land of light and joy in the fellowship of your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace.
On behalf of Congresswoman Slaughter's wonderful staff, many of whom are here today, I have been asked to do a reading from Romans. I consider that the suffering of, sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My beloved brothers and sisters, my friends, my colleagues, members of this wonderful and beautiful family, I want to be honest with you. This is hard. This is tough. Louis Slaughter was one of a kind. She was generous, she was friendly, she was warm. She was determined and she stood up for her beliefs. Louise, I think most members know, she was strong, she was solid, and she didn't take any stuff. <laughs> Maybe it has something to do with her growing up in Kentucky. You didn't want to get in an argument with her because you knew in the end she would have the victory of the last set. She would win. I first met Louise during freshman orientation we were elected together. 
we soon discovered that we share a love for the arts, and Louise particularly loved music. She loved the creative beauty of our world, of our little planet, our little spaceship we call Earth. You know, sometimes in life you run into people who love the world, just love the world, and they don't like people. <laughs> but Louise loved people. I will never forget when she invited me to come to Rochester in 2016. She was so gracious. She took me to a church that Frederick Douglass attended. She took me all around to several places. She wanted me to see her district. She wanted me to get to know her people. She took me to the mother house where a group of nuns from the Sisters of St. Joseph had retired. It was there I met two nuns who had taken care of us when we were hurt in Selma, Alabama in 1965. They cried, they hugged me, I cried, and Louise cried. Looking back, that moment demonstrated to me the true nature of Luz East, this beautiful, unbelievable, gifted, loving sister. She was the person who cared for the caretakers, for those who gave their life in service to the church or to the community or to the country. Louise was their champion, the person who fought for them after they have given all they could give. Louise believed deep down in her heart that government should do good for people. I think that is why she continued to serve. She never gave up. She never gave in. She kept her faith. For her, work was a calling, a mission. I'm grateful to her beautiful family, her daughters, her grandchildren, and great-grandson. The people of Rochester and the state of New York for sharing this brilliant, just unbelievable spirit with us for so many years. She was our leader. She was our friend. She was my sister. And that's why I call her Sister Louise. Now, Louise, I know you are watching us with Bob by your side. I cherish every moment that we shared. I must tell you, I love you and I will miss you. My sister, my friend, we will see you in the morning. Good morning. Good morning. Louise's passing last week brought forth a deluge of grief, joyful remembrances, and today, not one, but two planes full of members of Congress and staff from Congress to pay respects to Louise Slaughter. Chairman of her committee, Pete Sessions, our distinguished whips, Denny Hoyer, former members, too, Kathy Hochul, Lieutenant Governor of New York, uh, Senator Gillibrand, a senator but a former member of the House, uh, 
and of course, our inspiration, John Lewis. With your permission, I would love for these members to come from over 15 states, many members from each state, but to rise and so that we can recognize the, the condolences they bring to the people of Rochester. I know there's a contingent from Albany, too, but one person who bridged both is probably crying the most today, Paul Tonko, her pal. Meg, Amy, Robin, I hope it's a comfort to you that so many people in the country, in the world, in the Congress, share your grief, pray for you at this time, and bring the condolences of so many to you and to the people of Rochester and Louisa's district, which she loved so much, bragged about all the time, and worked so hard for. So our condolences to the people of her district, as she loved. I think the, uh, our colleague, Mr. Lewis, has always says everything so well, but from his words, you can tell that I think Louise was more ready to leave us than we were ready for her to leave us. How perfect this would be, these members of Congress, a president of the United States, the beautiful music, so many friends. We find solace in the fact that Louise has left us, but now she is with the love of her life, Bob. The love Louise and Bob shared was such a joy to all of us who knew them. I love when she showed us their wedding picture, how beautiful they were and continued to be, but they are together. She never stopped talking about Bob, except when she started talking about the children, the grandchildren, and the fact that she became a great-grandmother of beautiful Henry. Uh, she loved her family. We considered ourselves her official family, but she loved us, but she loved her family, first and foremost. When I first met Louise, I knew her by reputation. I said, Louise, I don't, I've never met you. I was in their class, but I was five months in a special election. So when I went there, one of the first persons that I met was Louise Slaughter. I said, I know you by reputation, and I respect you already because the person who bragged about you to me was Governor Mario Cuomo. He loved Louise. He just thought she could do anything and was so proud when she went to Congress. And so we're also thrilled that Matilda Cuomo is here today and honors us with her presence. That connection of the Cuomos and, the, and Louise and Bob was very special. It was my privilege to serve with her for over 30 years. But when we first went to Congress, there were only 23 women there, so we were only two of the 23, and we bonded uh, very closely. She felt a deep pride in representing this area in Seneca Falls and standing on the soldiers' shoulders of the suffragettes and then recognizing that others would be standing on ours. She brought us all a full contingent in the 1990s to Seneca Falls to Rochester and then to Seneca Falls uh, to observe the 150th anniversary of the convention. She just, it was all in her, it was practically in her DNA. She beamed when she campaigned for Hillary Clinton. She just beamed. She loved you so much. Campaigning for Hillary for president was so important to her, but also it was very important for her to mentor young women staff uh, that worked for her, and even mentoring members of Congress. She was always promoting women. Louise made Congress a more diverse, more welcoming to women, and more representative of our nation. She encouraged women, staff and members alike, to know their power. One of the joys of my speakership was to appoint her the first woman chair of the Rules Committee. That was historic. She loved that big office, didn't she? 
Didn't she, Jim McGovern? She loved that big office. Didn't she don her staff first in there? At the helm of the Rules Committee, she shaped and shepherded through every piece of legislation in the Congress. Louise was a patriot, and she fought to expand freedom in America, more freedom for women in the workplace by advancing the Lilly Ledbetter Act, more freedom for men and women in the military with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. More freedom for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in her leadership role in passing the Affordable Care Act. In that debate and throughout her service in Congress, Louise was a steadfast champion for women's reproductive freedom. And She was a crusader for ethics and honoring the public trust, embodied in her authorship of the landmark Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge, or the Stock Act. We're going to try to have that name for her. Louise was a microbiologist, did you know? And a visionary. And visionary. We learned a lot from her. And for many reasons, but a microbiologist. And don't tell me, let me tell you why it was so important in terms of public policy, in addition to giving her a perspective, a scientific perspective. She knew what the future held. She knew that what science could bring and what technology would unveil. She recognizing that discrimination could spring from technological advances. And she acted to stop it for over a decade, starting early. She authored and worked to pass the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, signed into law in 2008. As, as John said, you might as well just agree from the start and save yourself some time, because you were sooner or later going to come to The We shortened always the time and distance between what was inevitable to her and inconceivable to others. <laughs> Just do it now. All who worked with her became accustomed to late nights and long hours, were also blessed by her unfailing humor and warmth. I mentioned Don, the, I don't know if I mentioned Don at the uh, Rules Committee and Jim McGovern who worked right next to her. Jim told me a story that the last bill she was assigning, she gave to him and had some, forgive me, family, little salty language that went with it. And Jim said, Louise, I think the microphone's on. She said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> In any event, as Liam, her chief of staff, who has brought us here today, knew she was full of surprises. And I won't say it was a contradiction, it was just a balance she had. She was a woman of fire and force, with a great smile and a beautiful voice, a southern belle and a national leader, perfect balance of grit and grace. She could debate opponents fiercely on the floor and committee, and sing in harmony with them for charity in the evening. That beautiful voice, that beautiful accent. That was a little bit disarming to people from time to time, the accent. <laughs> Following her passing, many beautiful sentiments were expressed from Democrats and Republicans alike across America. One of my favorites was, she was a fierce tiger in committee and a sweet, gracious lady outside the arena. A Midwestern Republican spoke of her as a powerful force with a disarming accent. A Northern Democrat characterized her as a great, dignified lady, respected by all. Many spoke of her gracious spirit, wonderful demeanor, and the one compliment she would have loved the best. She truly made a difference. As John said, she loved the arts. One of the sources of her strength, frankly, was her love of the arts. She co-chaired the Arts Caucus, and she knew 
that the arts could be a unifying force in our country. She ascribed to what poet Shelley said about the arts, the greatest force for moral good is imagination. Imagination to be creative, to put yourself in other people's shoes, to create. And uh, people enjoying, she saw that when people came together around the arts, they laughed, they cried, they were inspired, they danced, they sang, they forgot their differences. Louise and Bob particularly enjoyed the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson, who described the sex, sex, successful life as this, to paraphrase. That means I shortened it a little bit. <laughs> Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> to laugh often and much, to win the affection of children, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a better place, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Certainly, Louise and Bob succeeded. In her memory, let us strive to meet that same measure, to leave the world better and to know that some have breathed easier because of our work. This, for Bob and Louise, this is their story, this is their song. Megan, Amy, Robin, the entire Slaughter family. The Congress was her official family, but her heart was always with her personal family. Thank you for sharing this beautiful soul with the world. She was a person of faith, faith in God, faith in country, faith in herself, faith in the future, faith in her district, faith in her family. God truly blessed America with the leadership and the life of Louise Slaughter. Thank you. This is the day the Lord has made, and we gather here for an extraordinary outpouring of love, love for Louise. There are people here from across her district, the state, our country, and even across the political spectrum. And that is something we should treasure and hope to see more of. Her proudest accomplishment, of course, is her family. Meg and Amy and Robin and her sons-in-law and her grandchildren and her great-grandson, her nephews, a great-nephew. And we gather as well in remembrance of the love of her life, her husband, Bob. I remember calling her after Bob's passing. And Louise was not someone who was ever at a loss for words. <laughs> but she just kept saying over and over again, I just don't know how I'm going to do it without him. I just don't know. And she had such a great marriage with a man who supported her, who along with her, raised her children. But as with so much else when it came to Louise, she pulled herself together and continued to serve. She really was one of a kind, a blacksmith's daughter, a microbiologist, interested in public health. Like a lot of women, she didn't get into politics to make a name for herself. She got into politics to make a difference. John Lewis is so right about so many things. 
our dear friend, our moral leader, and he's right that this is hard. It's hard because what she represented, who she was, not only should be remembered by all who knew her and all whom she served with and for, but because we need more Louise Slaughters today more than ever. She brought her practical, no-nonsense approach to every project she took on, from fighting to preserve local parklands before she ever held elected office, to fighting to pass health care reform with Leader Pelosi. It is legendary to think of her tenacity and determination. Nothing could stop Louise once she made up her mind. She was fierce and determined, but she also was savvy. She looked for ways to get done what she thought was best without alienating people. Even her opponents couldn't help liking and respecting her. And having a great sense of humor didn't hurt. When she was recovering from her broken leg, remember a few years ago, I called her again see how she was doing, and she was just mostly fussing. It wasn't a, a word of pity. It was all like, I can't believe this. I don't understand why they won't let me out. I mean, she had broken her leg in a <laughs> very serious way. And she then publicly said, and she explained to me that it had inspired a new campaign slogan, vote for Louise, she's got a leg up. <laughs> Now, as the people of Rochester and Buffalo and Niagara Falls know, there was no one better to have in your corner than Louise. She was one of the first to encourage me to run for the U.S. Senate back in 1999. After I was elected, she took me under her wing, showed me the ropes on Capitol Hill, something she did for many others, particularly women entering Congress. I had her enthusiastic support on my presidential campaigns, and it was always so much fun to run into Louise anywhere, in the Capitol, on the campaign trail, and hear her exclaim as only she could, "Honey." I've missed you like a front tooth. <laughs> We'd swap stories. She'd talk about grandchildren. When I finally got one, I talked about mine as well. <laughs> but what was so incredibly important about Louise is that she was always looking to the future. She was always looking for a better future for Western New York and for America. She was committed to training workers to compete in the global economy. She was committed to defeating breast cancer. She was committed to high-speed rail. And thank you, Amtrak, for naming the station for Louise. And in the midst of it all, she always stood up for science, facts, reason, and evidence. What an unusual uh, position for someone to take in these times. She was a passionate supporter of the National Institutes of Health. She worked tirelessly to see that women and minorities are included in all federal health trials. And she finally banned discrimination on the basis of genetic information. I loved going to meetings in her district with her. 
I remember so well when we spent a day meeting with experts at the University of Rochester who were tracking the effects of lead poisoning in children. This was long before the absolute tragedy of Flint, Michigan. We sat there and she probed and asked the toughest microbiological questions you could. And then we worked together to try to get the federal government to do more to get lead out of water, soil, and paint. We also had a lot of fun working together on the redevelopment of the Erie Canal Harbor, uh, bringing modern technology to our public schools. She was always up with new ideas about how to create more jobs in Buffalo and Rochester and Western New York. She saw the potential for a renaissance in American manufacturing and believed that Western New York was the perfect place for it. Uh, <laughs> of all the projects we worked together on, it was such a treat to work with visionary leaders like Dr. Nabil Nasser, who's here, to secure a grant for the Center for Integrated Manufacturing Studies at RIT. Today, it's one of the most highly regarded advanced manufacturing institutes in the entire world. And as Nancy said, she was the first woman to lead the House Rules Committee. She knew that rules and procedures are essential. They're essential tools for safeguarding our democracy and making it work. She believed showing respect and decency was too. As one of her friends observed this week, Louise was a partisan warrior, but she never made it personal. She thought we could disagree without being disagreeable. And if all else failed, showing up with a homemade rhubarb pie usually helped. I often thought how fitting it was that Bob and Louise moved to Western New York, a hallowed ground for women's rights. Advancing the rights, opportunities, and full, parta uh, full participation of women and girls was, as she said, necessary in the classroom, on the playing field, in the laboratory, and everywhere else. That was a big part of her life's work. She was also a driving force behind the Violence Against Women Act. and one of the fiercest voices in Congress advocating for equal pay and for every woman's right to make her own health decisions. <clears throat> I still remember that day back in 1998 when Louise and I both attended the 150th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. Now, some of you might have been there, but I can remind you, it was a scorching hot July day. And when Louise got up to speak, we were on the football field in Seneca Falls, so there was no shade anywhere, and the bleachers were crowded, and, and she looked out at the crowd, and she noted with some surprise that her immense respect for the women who had gathered there all those years ago in 1848 had actually grown as she sat on the stage, contemplating not only their sacrifice and struggle, but the fact that each of them would have been wearing about 25 pounds of dresses, corsets, hats, and gloves in the summer heat. She also remarked that day with a note of awe in her voice that things have happened in Western New York that surely have happened nowhere else. So, <laughs> Louise's affection for her district, both its storied history and its exciting future, shone through everything she said and did. Oh, I loved working with her. It was a treasured experience. 
When we worked on the National Women's History Project, a labor of love for both of us, she was determined that our four mothers would be known as well as our four fathers. And today, thanks in large measure to her efforts, people can come to Rochester from around the world, perhaps taking the train to the Louise M. Slaughter Intermodal Station, to see that history come to life. They can stand in the parlor where Susan B. Anthony was arrested for the crime of voting as a woman. They can take a short drive down the thruway to Seneca Falls where Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass and many others gathered together for the first time in world history to proclaim that all men and women are created equal. So, Louise, <laughs> Louise never forgot. She stood on the shoulders of brave trailblazers and history makers. She picked up their torch. She carried it proudly throughout her career. She was fighting not for ourselves alone, but for generations to come. So now, as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in New York State, we can pay tribute to those leaders, but also to the life and legacy of Louise Slaughter, who proved that they were right all those years ago in Seneca Falls to fight for equality. I know her indomitable spirit will inspire women scientists, public officials, everywhere to get in the arena, to serve their communities, to run for office, to speak up and fight for what you know to be right. I hope each of us will honor Louise's legacy by being passionate advocates for facts and reason, by keeping our sights set on the long term and the bigger picture, and by doing it with a sense of humor, respect, and decency. What a great tribute to Louise that will be. So thank you, Louise. Thanks for spurring us on, for setting the bar extraordinarily high when it comes to public service, for enriching our lives and our country. You will be dearly missed, but never forgotten. God bless you, my friend. to follow. <laughs> My name is Fran Weisberg. Like most of you, I am heartbroken and so saddened over the loss of a very dear friend. As a resident of Rochester, I am also in disbelief. We all thought Louise would go on forever, representing our community and standing up always for what is right. But I first met Louise, as Rob and I talked about a few days ago, in the early 1970s through Bob Slaughter, her beloved husband of 57 years. It was the People's Power Coalition we were involved with, and Bob was an active member of that group. We were a bunch of grassroots volunteers who fought to keep electric rates affordable across the entire community. But at no point did Louise ever say to Bob, don't do this, it wouldn't be good for my career. She believed in this community, she believed in him, and in standing up for what was right, which was what her husband was doing. She supported our coalition with all the qualities that she took to Congress, that Southern charm, that unbelievably brilliant mind, and that fierce, fierce desire to help people much less fortunate than herself. From that time to the day she died, 
Louise Slaughter spent her life fighting for this community. She never backed down from a challenge or passed up a good idea. What drove Louise and what defined her was her personal integrity. Louise always transcended personal politics, and she will always be remembered for that. She truly did care about people. She helped so, so many people, and everyone thought she was their friend. That does help to explain Louise's first run for Congress in 1986. I was her campaign manager, and it is incredibly hard to explain what a crazy long shot that election was at the time. National meeting called it the second most difficult House race in the country for a Democrat to win. The district at the time was heavily Republican. The incumbent congressman was a Republican, of course, and had served five times in the state Senate before winning the House seat. And Louise was a liberal Democrat, and she had much less name recognition after just two terms in the state assembly. And guys, back then, that Southern draw that became so familiar only made it surprise voters that Louise was not a native of upstate New York. But none of that was going to stop us. We were out there to change the world, and Louise was ready to fight for what was right. But Louise was not the kind of politician who liked making big formal speeches or, trust me, asking for big money. She preferred events like house parties, town hall meetings, where she could talk informally and truly get to know people. She especially loved campaigning door to door, where she would meet individual families and discuss how Congress could make their lives better. Louise Slaughter single-handedly built an unprecedented coalition of support in this community. Black, white, Latino, labor, business, urban, suburban, rural, gay, straight, and there were even so many Republicans, we had to do a new bumper strip, Republicans for Slaughter. People from every walk of life learned that Louise cared about them. She would always fight for this community and the people in it. As the campaign manager, though, it was my job to keep Louise on a tight schedule with events and phone calls. Invariably, it was a time to leave one event. Louise would say she just needed one more minute to talk to Mrs. Smith's family or to talk to Mr. Jones about a problem he was happen having. I remember getting more and more frustrated that just one minute would stretch into 20 minutes or even an hour. But Louise was never impatient. She truly cared about each person she met and would work later herself to give people the time they needed now. While the Republicans ran against big government, Louise provided hope and optimism. People believed that she would go to Washington and make government work for them, because it was true. Her message resonated with voters, and against all odds, we won in a very close election. And that 1980, somebody said to me at the calling hours, that 1986 race was a movement that I submit as a movement still today for her. Louise's esteemed colleagues talked so much about how she became a national leader and what role, what role model she was for women. But for those of us in Rochester who have known her the longest, perhaps the most amazing thing about Louise is that she has never changed in 32 years in Congress. She has a, had a house in Washington, but home was always 14 Manor Hill Drive in Fairport with her family. She met with world leaders and shared powerful committees, but Louise always remained humble, more comfortable at that spaghetti dinner in Chai Lai than the state dinner in Washington, at least to us. She never, ever stopped using her office to support this community, from helping a family with an immigration problem, to securing a university research grant, to creating jobs in the photonics industry, 
to building that new train station, Louise cared about all of us in this community. She used her charm, her brilliant mind, and her relentless energy to get the job done. Louise never changed. She never forgot what was important or who brought her to Washington. She never lost her passion for this community and for helping her neighbors. Louise left us at a time when our nation and our community needs more fighters, people like her, people who put concern for others above themselves. When I think about Louise's legacy, I think it's more than any structure or legislative accomplishment. It's the example that she set. We can all pay Louise back by resolving to be more like her, caring more deeply for our community, listening more carefully to each other, and fighting relentlessly for what is right. Instead of divisions and dividing, Let's find common ground, common purpose, and real solutions. That is the example Congresswoman Slaughter set for all of us. It is what Louise deserves from the community she served so long and so well. Goodbye, dear friend. Jesus me. 
That was absolutely beautiful. Um, all the music has been beautiful, but my mother and I used to harmonize together, so I particularly enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. This is just such an honor to be here and to know how many people cared about my mother and loved her, and I want you to know how important that is to our family. Thank you so much. So as you all know, but I'm so proud, and I say it all the time, my mother was a coal miner's daughter who remembered when the unionizers came to the mining town, they weren't allowed to walk on the sidewalk because it was owned by the coal mine company. She could tell you what it was like when the Tennessee Valley Authority strung the wire in the kitchen that was the first and only light bulb in their home. Her father, Oscar Lewis McIntosh, known to all as O.L. or Mac, was, among other things, a coal mine foreman who provided for his family during the Depression by playing pool. This was in spite of missing several fingers from an accident um, from when he worked in a sawmill as a teenager. When I asked him once if he was a pool shark, he said, no, I was just very good. And I'm going to spare you accents, because my children have informed me that all of my accents sound Scottish. <laughs> um, O.L. also held the first patent for an automatic chair nailing machine, and my cousin reminded me earlier that I need to say that he also played major league, um, excuse me, minor league baseball. Um, my mother's mother, who arguably had the best name ever, Daisy Grace Byers McIntosh, was a foster grandmother to develop mentally disabled kids, a theme that I would later take up in my professional career. Granny Grace also loved to sing and encouraged her daughters to do the same. First in church, but later on, mom sang with Tinker Baggardly's big band in heels and beautiful evening dresses. Throughout her life, she never missed an opportunity to belt out a ballad. That was one of the many ways she showed how strong and brave she really was. But the message to my mom in those early years was not exactly, you can do whatever you put your mind to, as there was a strong bias toward the boys. Sadly, she also had a sister who died in childhood, leading others to tell my mother, God takes the good ones, a story she would retell over the decades with tears in her eyes. 
a failure of healthcare's, the healthcare system, too long a wait to see a doctor, an unnecessary surgery, the death of a child, and a rift in the family. But thankfully, O.L. and Grace were forward-thinking enough to put all four of their surviving children through college. Family lore says that O.L. picked what they would study. In Mom's case, he seems to have made a good choice. Maybe he had an inkling that she would come to love the scientific way of thinking, her way of seeing clearly what the problem was and of insisting on a potent solution. So guess what mom did after getting her master's? She went around the country asking people if Jif was a good name for peanut butter. <laughs> and while in Texas doing this, she met my father. And here comes domestic Louise, who breastfed her babies at a time when this had fallen out of favor. She took tailoring classes, which led to winter coats that were so heavy and thick, because she was always cold, that they would destroy wire hangers. <laughs> she was, not surprisingly, more liberal than most of the other moms. We could dress as hippies and watch R-rated movies and go to D.C. to protest the Vietnam War. People of color visited our home before any lived in our community. While in the assembly, she rented a room from a gay couple in Albany at a time when AIDS was called the gay plague. She also fully endorsed my decision to become a vegetarian at 13 and arranged for me to, re to meet with a Holocaust survivor who had um, gotten through the prison camps by trading his meat for vegetables. So, as we all know, it's very hard to sum up the life of someone as big as my mother. What I want people to remember is that she came from humble roots, but was outspoken. She was a no-nonsense person, but she was very funny. She traveled the world, but always had time to hit the Children's Museum with her grandchildren. Seeing all of you here today, and hearing all of the stories about mom from friends, co-workers, constituents, and people she just met in Wegmans, <laughs> I'm certain that she will be remembered as the amazing woman she was. And please know that her family takes great comfort in knowing that she was loved. Thank you. I am Michael Minerva, Louise's son-in-law. People often ask me, how did you end up in Rochester of all places? And I always reply, it's a classic tale. Boy meets girl, girl's mom lives in Rochester. <laughs> of course, the plot twist here is that this girl's mom happens to be Louise Slaughter. My beautiful wife, Emily Robin, and I moved our family back to Rochester over 17 years ago so that our three children, Mason, Linus, and Ione, could grow up with her grandparents, Louise and Bob. Louise always considered this to be a gift. And in return, her presence in our children's lives helped shape who they are today. The following are just a few small stories about Louise's ordinary life away from Washington, at home with our kids. One Thanksgiving, when Bob brought the turkey into the dining room, Ione, who was about five at the time, sat up straight in her chair. She held a sign up in front of her face. She had made it out of a paper plate, and around the edges, she glued colored construction paper so that it looked like a turkey. On it, she wrote, you killed the turkey. <laughs> and then she proceeded to chant, don't eat the turkey. Why did, you, why did you kill the turkey? Don't eat the turkey. Why did you kill the turkey? Louise let out a loud laugh, that loud laugh that we all know and love, and said, Ione, you are a hoot. She loved seeing her youngest granddaughter show empathy and advocate for others, even if that other was just a turkey. When Mason was about three, 
He got caught up in an argument with his grandma. I can't remember what the argument was about or even how it got started, but many of you here in this hall know what it's like to feel the force of Louise from the other side of a debate. Mason was steadfast and held his ground, and Louise accused him of being stubborn. Mason retorted and said she was, in fact, the stubborn one. And the debate quickly shifted to who was more stubborn, Louise or Mason. Mason finally quipped, Grandma, you stubborn ox. Now, for those of you who do not speak three-year-old dialect, that translates to, Grandma, you are stubborn as an old ox. <laughs> now, being stubborn is only bad if you're stubborn for all the wrong reasons. But Louise was stubborn for all the right reasons. She fought tirelessly for the ideals and causes she believed in because she was grounded in her values. At her core and in her heart and soul, she believed in honesty, fairness, equality, and integrity. These are the values that all politicians should be grounded in. These are the values that all people should be grounded in. Louise was there when Linus took his first steps. She was sitting on her couch, aggressively red marking her weekly reports after a Sunday, typical Sunday dinner. Linus was standing, bracing himself on the coffee table in front of Louise. He would let go and fall to the ground. We would pick him up, put him back up, and then he would let go and fall to the ground. He did this over and over. Louise noticed that bobbing head that kept appearing above that table. She lowered the paper she was working on, looked at him and said, you can do it. Linus let go, took five wobbly steps towards her, and when he reached her stretched out arms, they both laughed out loud. She loved witnessing and supporting those first steps. She loved that he kept trying over and over. She loved that he did not quit. Empathy, standing firm for what you believe in and never quitting, I consider these to be the gifts that Louise left to our children and to us all. To many here today, to be in the presence of Louise was an honor. To me, to be included in our family is a blessing. Rest in peace, Lou. I am Louise's firstborn granddaughter. My mother, her firstborn daughter, and I'm sure most of you expect me to start by saying, while well, you all know her as Congresswoman Slaughter, I think of her as just my grandma. But that's not true. I've always been so proud of the work that she's done. And to hear from hundreds of her friends, her colleagues, and constituents over the past week has been overwhelming. Your grandma changed my life with one email. Your grandma was my champion. We talked about recipes in the airport once. <laughs> I never met your grandma, but she meant a lot to me as a little girl. Multiple people at last night's calling hours thanked us as a family for sharing her with the community, as if it was a sacrifice. It wasn't a sacrifice, it was an honor. That is why I've never thought of her as just my grandma. In fact, I could not be more proud to think of her as my grandmother, the Congresswoman. What's it like when your grandmother is a Congresswoman? Well, like most grandmas, we'd come visit her in the summer, except when your grandma is a politician, instead of going to a Fourth of July parade, you might be marching in it. Like most grandmas, she told us to wash up before supper. But when your grandma is a microbiologist, she followed that up with a 10-minute explanation of how germs are passed human to human. And did you know that simple hand washing can actually decrease the likelihood of global antibiotic resistance? <laughs> like most grandmas, she would brag about your latest report card with the waitress. Except when your grandma is a congresswoman, this takes place in the Capitol dining room. And when your grandma is Louise Slaughter, as soon as she's done talking about your report card, 
she turns right back to the waitress to ask her how her own children and grandchildren are doing. She uses their first names and follows up on small details. She's committed to memory. Like most grandmas, she wanted her granddaughters to have opportunities she never had. But when your grandma is a trailblazer, when she is elected to Congress when you are a five-year-old little girl, when she not only hopes that you are afforded the rights, protections, and powers given to any man, but passes legislation to ensure it happens, when your grandma is a trailblazer, your path in life doesn't look like a trail. It looks like an open road. I am honored to carry on her legacy in small ways. She had a jawline as strong as her backbone. And while I'm working on the latter, I definitely have the former. I was also gifted her singing voice, as well as the habit of jumping in with the alto harmony, whether or not anyone asks us to. <laughs> and I was given her name. My middle name is Louise because both of my grandmothers were actually named Louise. They were two women of the same time who lived completely different lives, but each of them taught me how to be strong. And while my legacy will live on in my bones, my voice, my name, everyone in this room has the ability to carry on her legacy in the most important way possible, through our actions. We can live a life of purpose. We can speak truth to power. We can envision a better world and use political will to get us there. That's why tomorrow morning I have a 5 a.m. flight to D.C. to march in honor of a former student who I lost to gun violence. I owe that to my student, and I owe it to her, and we all do. In the words of another strong woman, Maya Angelou, we are braver and wiser because they existed, those strong women and strong men. We are who we are because they were who they were. It's wise to know where you come from, who called your name. I'd like to end by sharing my grandma's favorite story about me. I don't know why it was her favorite. It is the smallest, seemingly insignificant memory. But I know it was her favorite because she recounted the story to me every single time she saw me, <laughs> including the last time we saw each other. As the story goes, I was about a year old, and Grandma and Grandpa Bob had been in town for a visit. As she would tell it, Lauren, you were only one year old, but you somehow understood that we were leaving and you look so sad. I will never forget your little face standing there in your purple raincoat, looking so devastated that Granny and Grandpa were leaving. It just broke my heart. Grandma, I don't know if I was ever as smart as you thought I was. And I definitely no longer have that purple raincoat. But I am so sad that you and Grandpa have left. I love you both. Let me start by telling you a little story about the last time that I was here in Rochester. It was this past summer, and uh, me and my wife and our then, our then three-month-old son, her great-grandson, were spending a couple of days in Fairport before going to Buffalo for a wedding. 
And on that last morning, before we could get out the door, she insisted that she cook us breakfast. Country ham. We couldn't leave the house until we had some of her country ham. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Southern cooking, let me try and describe my grandmother's country ham to you. Weaponized salt. <laughs> this was a piece of pan-fried meat that was as tough as leather and so salty that you couldn't taste anything for the rest of the day. I couldn't taste the size of my mouth. But like a good grandson, I, I sat down at the table, I fought through the ham, chasing it down with as much orange juice as I could, and I thanked her for breakfast. And as we were sitting at the table, me and Grandma, my wife with our son on her lap, she looked over at my son and she said, my God, that's the most beautiful baby I ever saw. I said to her, Grandma, I appreciate the sentiment, but you also just said that this ham was the most delicious breakfast you ever had, <laughs> so I don't know if I can trust you. And she just smiled and shook her head and said, well, they're both true. Now, I just told you that story because I didn't want to start out with something sad. The truth is that when I started to think about what I would say here today, the first and most honest thought that came to mind was simply that I'm going to miss her. As greedy as it sounds, 33 years of life with her didn't seem like it was enough. And I've tried to comfort myself by saying that she lived a long and fulfilling life, that she missed my grandfather dearly and wanted to see him again, and that it was her time. The first two of those statements are undeniably true. More than anyone I have ever met, my grandmother lived a long and fulfilling life. The mere bullet points of her life story are so remarkable in that they hew so closely to what we would call the American dream. You heard it from Amy. Born in a coal mining town in Harlan County. First woman in her family to go to college. Went to work for a company that defined the American boom of the 20th century and met a young serviceman and fell in love. When she and Grandpa Bob first came to Rochester, they had so little that my mother as a newborn slept in a drawer. And today she's being mourned by presidents. That's a life. And it's also true that she loved my grandfather dearly. She loved him as much as one person could love another. And I know this because she told me. She never hesitated to tell me how much he meant to her. And in fact, for the rest of my life, I know that I will never be able to wear a bow tie without thinking that I don't wear it as well as he did. <laughs> because I will always hear her voice in my head. I always see her smiling at him across the room as we were getting ready to go to a dinner and saying, my God, Bob, you look good today. <laughs> so there's no question that she lived a great life, and there is no question that the person that she loved most has already left us. But I struggle to bring myself to say that it was her time, because I know that she wasn't done living every day of her life and she wasn't done fighting. And I know I'm not the only one that feels this way. The crowd in this room and the love that we have received this week are testament enough to the fact that none of us were ready to see her go. But we don't have a choice. She's gone and we have to satisfy ourselves with our memories. Where we do have a choice though, is in how we honor her for the rest of our own lives. And for that, believe it or not, I have to come back to that country ham. <laughs> if 
Because as I was thinking about that morning, it occurred to me that that was hardly the first time I had heard her call something the greatest thing she'd tasted in the world, the best thing she'd ever saw. In fact, it wasn't even close. She took so much joy from everything in this world. She found joy in the smallest things, whether it was Boney James' version of what are you doing New Year's Eve, the way the Capitol Dome looked when it was lit up at night, or a good tomato crop in August. I can remember walking through a farmer's market here in Rochester. We went from a table that had the best tomato you ever saw to one that had the best peach and finished at another one that had the most gorgeous sunflowers in the world. All right here. <laughs> Nothing was too small for her to love. And she found joy in the bigger things, too. Her family, of course, Grandpa Bob and their daughters, the rest of us that came later. This city, and if you need evidence of that, let me tell you, I've never lived a day here, but I can give you a fairly comprehensive history of Eastman Kodak, thanks to her. <laughs> and of course, her job. She took so much joy and pride in her job and in our American democracy and her role in it. I will never forget walking through the cafeteria under her office one afternoon and seeing a group of students from overseas pass us by. Some of them wearing headscarves, speaking in Arabic. And she turned to me and she said, look at that. People from all over the world come here to see how our government works. That's the most wonderful thing I ever saw. <laughs> and you know what? If you want to know what made her such an effective advocate for Rochester, and what made her such a powerful fighter for everyone in this country who needed her, it was that joy and that love that she found in the world. It was simply that she loved the world so much that she couldn't help but fight for it. And that's what we can do to honor her. That's how we keep her time running. Not all of us can be in Congress. Not all of us can rebuild their city's train station. Sometimes it's too hard even to make it to the march for the cause you believe in, as my sister is doing tomorrow. But what we can do, each one of us, is wake up in the morning and remember that the world is a beautiful place, that country ham is the best breakfast you ever had, <laughs> that your son is the most beautiful baby you ever saw, and we can remember, most importantly, that all that beauty in the world does not come no strings attached. We are responsible for fighting for it, just like she did. It isn't always easy to see all the beauty and the good in the world. And in fact, lately at times, it has seemed impossible. The fact that she could is what made her so remarkable. And if we can only try to see the world the way that she did, starting every morning at the breakfast table, then we will honor her. Louise McIntosh Slaughter, the best grandmother you could ever have. Thank you. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, 
for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Pretend that translation was, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called children of God. Blessed are we who mourn, we shall be comforted. Blessed is she who was a peacemaker, she shall be called a daughter of God. Blessed is she who was a peacemaker, maybe not a quiet, passive, submissive peacemaker, but peace that matters is more than inward and spiritual. Peace that matters is shared peace. Peace that matters shows itself outwardly in the welfare of the earth and all of its inhabitants. Louise, your grandmother, your mother, she knew what the peacemakers of the world have always known, that peace is one where reverence for all creation and the sharing of Earth's resources takes place, that peace is one where the shared awareness of the innate dignity of human labor and of how our common life together depends upon each other's toil takes place. And any of us who would follow in her footsteps, we have to remember and we have to help each other remember that this kind of peace has never been won easily. And as Daniel reminded us, it really hasn't been won yet. But this kind of peace is never won easily and that for whatever reasons, there are always forces who will oppose it. But all of that is not for today. It's already been said so eloquently that today is the day we mourn. Some more than others, but we all mourn. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you know one of the root meanings for mourn is to long after, to long after. And we are longing after Louise. And you notice that the more we pray and share, and sing our longing, the deeper and the wider our longing after becomes. And it actually gathers us in and it makes this place holy. Our longing after Louise, who is with us, makes this theater, transforms it into a sanctuary. Our mourning is holy to God and so is your nostalgia. So is our nostalgia. Do you know that one of the root meanings for nostalgia is agony for home, agony for home. To long for home is to long for the past and the ones that we love but we see no longer, especially the ones that we've known forever. Maybe it's to long for the children that we played with who are no longer children and so we long for our childhood we long for the ones who raised us and who helped raise us, the, where the, the, the way they were when they swung us by our arms in the backyards of our childhood homes, the way they sang the hymns that they loved with clear, strong voices, the way they climbed the stairs of our childhood homes to tuck us in, and the way they once walked in their bodies with vigor. We long for the past. We long for their past. We long for our past with them. 
for Louise's past, for your past with her, and that longing is holy to God. Nostalgia is also very deep and very wide and very beautiful, and it's very God-given because it turns, us no, it turns us not only toward our past, and Louise would appreciate this, but she probably already knew it. If nostalgia has a root meaning that is agony for home, it turns us also toward our future. At any given minute, where we, whether we know it or not, at any given moment, we are looking or hoping for what is to come. We're looking or hoping for what is to come, not because we're bored or restless, or, but because we know, we know there's more to come. And we know that there's more to this old world than meets the eye. We know that. We're hardwired to know that. And something in us longs for that more which is to come. Even if we're helpless to name or to articulate what it is, that we long for. Maybe you felt it. Maybe, maybe you're standing at the kitchen sink and you're putting the dishes away and, and the evening light falls across your hands and you look up and you look outside the window and suddenly you vaguely remember that there's more to life than meets the eye. And suddenly something about the evening sun lights up the, the dishes and the sink and the kitchen and suddenly the kitchen is transformed and it's, it's both holy and it's ordinary at the same time. But, but no matter what, maybe you felt it, that, that feeling that, that you live, that we all live with one foot in this world and the other foot not. And we were born that way. We were born with nostalgia, agony for home, the home from where we came and the home where we're headed. And, because Louise is who Louise is, and because God is who God is, we're home together now. God is all in all. Louise is all in all. We are all in all. If God is all in all, we are all together in this, this theater-turned-sanctuary-turned-home is where God and Louise and all of us gather in together. And she's done that, and God has done that, and maybe the homes that we long for are in the past, but remember that we also long for this home that we can't quite see, but we know it's ours, and someday, as C.S. Lewis put it, someday the door on which we've been knocking all of our lives will be opened at last. And it's been opened to Louise, and she's gone through it. And so we mourn and we celebrate at the same time, Mostly we mourn, but we are not left alone. And I know that if Louise were here, she'd want to comfort y'all because that's who she was. She wants y'all to be comforted. We are not left alone. You are not left alone. She's gathered us in. You see, you see this light, the Paschal candle, the light of this candle? This tells of a light that's before the beginning and it's after the ending, and it tells of a light that that has lit this whole theater up. It doesn't matter if we can't see that light. The light that, that this candle points us to has lit this whole theater up, and it's made it into a sanctuary of a God who overcomes death with love. There's more to this theater and this candle than meets the eye. And there's more to this candle and to this urn then meets the eye. Don't waste your time trying to decide what you believe about that. Just breathe it in. Just breathe it in and let it be that your longing after your mother is holy to God, that God, in fact, makes his home in your longing. It is a holy place. And one day the door will be opened to us, in some ways, it already is. The, the veil between earth and heaven is surprisingly thin. The door will be open to us. The chariot will swing low for all of us. And we will all be brought home together.
sweet, sweet chariot.
trombone swing, uh, just a little swing, uh, yes, make you feel it, he's coming, carry you Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Father of mercy and giver of comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with all who mourn that, casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love. And let the people say, Amen. Almighty God, we pray to you for those we love, but see no longer. Grant them your peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And in your loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of your perfect will. And let the people say, Amen. Grant, O oh Lord, to all who are bereaved of the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience, not sorrowing as those without hope, but in faithful remembrance of your great goodness and in your joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And let the people say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful and the compassionate. God Almighty, we offer our prayers for our Congresswoman Louis Slaughter. She was truly humane, kind, and compassionate. She cared for all people, irrespective of their color, race, or faith. She cared for strangers and immigrants and for all of your creation. She served our city, she served our state and our country with passion and sincerity. God Almighty, we pray, we pray to you to have mercy upon her. 
and to receive her soul to rest in peace. And we all say, Amen. Amen. God Almighty, we pray for the family of Congresswoman Louise Slatter. We pray to support them through these days of deep grieving. We pray that you draw this family together as they move through their grief. And we pray to bless this family with patience and forbearance. And you all say, Amen. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of humanity, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, for sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Louise. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. 